Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Dylan Wissing, who's going to be teaching us all about the funky drummer breakbeat. Dylan, how are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Um, I'm excited to have you here because uh, this is such a famous drum beat that is, as we were talking before, it's really difficult. Mm-hmm. First off, it's incredibly creative, mm-hmm. uh, and it has kind of changed hip hop music forever and in multiple genres, but, uh, it's, it's, I would dare say maybe one of the most famous drum beats of all time. Absolutely. Um, And I'm sure you, you know, way more about that. So, um, we'll get into, you've been doing some really cool stuff yourself, but, but with researching the entire, everything about the beat, but, um, why don't we start with you telling us the history of this, let's say song because funky drummer, let's again, Let's talk about it like like it's someone who knows nothing about it. So uh, sure. why don't you teach us about Funky Drummer by James Brown, which is performed by Clyde Stubblefield. So uh, just take it away, my friend. Sure. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's a song called Funky Drummer by James Brown. It was uh, came out as a single in 1970. Um, it's a, there's an A side and a B side each about three minutes long on the, on the singles just only came out as a single. I think it went to number 50 on the charts. It was not a, not a big seller, uh, by, by James Brown's, uh, standards at all. Uh, apparently they played it kind of as an instrumental in the live show for a little while, several months. It kind of came, it, it went, I'm told from a few different people that, uh, it was just sort of a throw off they went in the studio they that day they recorded some other things some overdubs and this and that and then they just sort of recorded this jam session in the studio one take uh there's an the the full version's about nine minutes long and from what i understand it was based on clyde was just in the studio just sort of you know playing a clyde beat and they they jumped in or you know somebody had some riff on the bass and they, you know, they just sort of built this thing up. And James came in and, and started adding adding his James Brown to it. And it became this, they, they recorded the track, nine minutes long. They, uh, the track is, is based on this, this beat that Clyde plays. And in the middle of the song, at about five minutes in, there's a section where James Brown says, I don't know what you do doing no solo and just, you know, keep playing this beat you're doing. Uh, I, I forget the exact phrasing, but um, yeah. so the band drops out and there are two measures of Clyde Stubblefield playing this beat. And right at that, at that section where the, this break beat happens, um, they have, it sounds like they've added some sort of compression and reverb of some, some type to it, where all of a sudden the drums go from being pretty just raw and dry to it's got this, this thing, this, the sound just sort of pops yeah. out of nowhere. And then it's just James and Clyde grooving for eight measures. And then that stops the whole, the rest of the band comes in. They play to the, uh, to the end of nine minutes at the, at the final, final last few, uh, last few seconds of the song, kind of as, as the song fades out, uh, Clyde does another solo. That's a little more, um, he gets a little more involved and starts playing some other stuff with it. Uh, but I, you know, a nine minute song, he, he, I don't think he ever touches the floor tom. I think he hits the rack tom precisely twice or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah. He barely dings the ride cymbal, I think, precisely twice in, in nine minutes or, or three times or something. Wow. Um, and it's an incredible piece of drumming. I mean... It is. I, I, you know, I, I think it was pretty revolutionary for the time. I, I don't know of anyone else from that period who played... You know, it, it was recorded, a, you know, several months before I was born. So obviously I wasn't there. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know anything else from that time period that sounds like what Clive Stubblefield did on, on Funky Drummer. No. And so, um, so yeah, the, so the song was, um, so the song was released as a single. It came, it went and just sort of disappeared. It wasn't on any of James Brown's uh, 12 inch LPs or anything. And in the eighties, it got rediscovered by hip hop producers. Uh, I, I believe Hank Shockley found it or uh, that's my understanding, but it suddenly started showing up everywhere in the eighties. And that's when I first became aware of it. 
in, in the eighties. And, and I knew it from my first real exposure to it was, um, was fight the power by, by, uh, public enemy, which was just an, an amazing track. And especially at the time, yeah. oh, that thing just, that, that track just exploded out of every speaker I, I heard it from. And those drums, you know, and then you kept hearing those drums everywhere. Uh, there was a huge hit called uh, Poison, Bell Biv DeVoe in the uh, late 80s, early 90s with the real fairness drum beat. That It's a totally different rhythm, but it's, they sampled the snare drum and there's that, that weird oh. snare drum sound again. Um, and for decades, the song was the, the most... Uh, the most sampled breakbeat in history. I think just recently in the past couple of years, it's been surpassed by um, uh, a breakbeat, the opening from the song Impeach the President by um, by the Honey Drippers, which is a, a really cool really? breakbeat as well. But I, as far as I can tell, and my, my source for all of this is the website, uh, whosampled.com, for in terms of um, these wh- where these samples are showing up in records. And uh, yeah, so I mean... It, this beat i think everybody on the planet's heard it in some form or another or somewhere on some song um you just may not know it it's it's just been a revolutionary sample and i've seen it listed as sort of the sort of the birthplace of hip-hop in some ways or or, you know like one of the founding just founding bedrock samples of of hip-hop uh and of course it's crossed over to pop all sorts of different places, you know, Sinead O'Connor had a big hit sure. with it, um, back in the nineties. And, and, um, you know, a friend of mine was told me the other day, you heard it in some commercial on TV, maybe Burger King or something. I don't remember exactly what, but I mean, Man. it's still very much, very much around. My thought with that is, is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason they would have chosen this is because it was so accessible. It was so easy to chop a naked drum part, that was yeah. happening for eight measures by itself. Right. Yeah. I mean, that seems pretty obvious. Yeah. That's, I mean, that, that's kind of the whole genesis of these breakbeats, you know, finding, and, and I mean, back in the seventies, they were doing it with turntables and two copies of the same record, which I mean, that's, that's a skill I will never master. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> totally, that's, that's rocket science to me. I, I don't understand how they do that, but they do. And, uh, you know, so to be able to just continuously cut back and forth between two records with these, with these beats long before sampling, um, oh. uh, it's, it's an incredible skill, absolutely an incredible yeah. skill. And watching somebody who really knows what they're doing on a, you know, a couple of vinyl turntables is just, I mean, that's it's, crazy. It's jaw dropping. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and there was that, there was kind of a fad is not the right word. There was a, a fashion for on a lot of these songs, you know, these, these R and B and and soul songs from the sixties and seventies where they would just cut out, you know, the band would cut out and you just hear the drums. And uh, mm-hmm. so a lot of times what would happen is on the record itself, uh, you know, I, on, they'd be making these records with, and there'd be compression on, on different elements. So, you know, the band drops out, they, the, the compression is holding all the other levels for the whole band um, you know, at a level, so, so nothing's speaking and nothing's distorting. And then suddenly the rest of the band drops out and the compressor just grabs these drum breaks and, and really pulls them up to, to get the levels up, uh, which all yeah. of a sudden these drum breaks have this really cool sound. You know, this really compression is just an amazing, amazing thing on the sounds of, of recorded drums. So, you know, yes. you, you get these sections where all of a sudden, you know, the compressor is grabbing those drum beats and just yanking them to the top. And, and of course, affecting the sound to bring out all this other stuff that is otherwise covered by the rest of the band. And, you know, you get these insanely cool little two bar breaks or, or you know, there, some are some are, you know, three beats and, and those three beats then become, uh, you know, the whole foundation for a brand new song, a brand new break beat. Um mm. So I, you know, I, I find this so cool. I, I, I love this stuff. And for me, it was, it was, um, there were, there was sort of a a trio of records that came out in the late eighties, early nineties that were, I just breakbeat heaven, which were, um, tripod quest, low end theory, um, De La Soul, three feet high and rising. And then, um, uh, the beastie boys, Paul's boutique. I mean, and and each of those just (laughs) grabbed some of the world's most classic samples so, you know, that, that whole era of the sort of classic hip hop pulling from 
these classic or or underground R and B jazz soul records. Um, man, that stuff is just that that has sort of ruled my life for decades. It's led to what you're doing now, which which to talk about that, and then I think we can even zoom in more. So um, so you run gettingthesound.com. So you've basically been on a journey to discover everything you can about this particular beat. So can you take us even further into like the gear he used? Sure. The studio equipment. And and it's fun to to note that um so this was recorded at King Records, which is located here in Cincinnati, Ohio, mm-hmm. where um where I am. So mm-hmm. pretty neat uh connection there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that is cool. It's a that's a nice surprise. I you know, I, I hope you'll go over and take a look or take pictures of the of the studio because it's it's still standing. It is. I've I've driven by it. I know, um, and, and I, I can try and find out more, but I know that it is currently being restored. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Bootsy, who's kind of a Cincinnati icon, is involved in the restoration. Um, and I think it's going to try and be restored and turned back into an operating studio because there's cool. a lot of history there. So oh, man, there's um, so much history there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the let's see, guys. So the, the I started the site getting the sound.com and, and the funky drummer is, is the first great beat we've looked at. Uh, we, we have some others coming up. Um, and it's, for me, it's, that's the Holy grail break beat. I mean, it's so distinctive and so yeah. hard there, you know, there's so many things to go into with this particular break beat. So let's see. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a session drummer. I have a recording studio in, in Hoboken, New Jersey, and I've been doing these, sort of sample recreations for since the mid 2000s uh which is just a it's an area of music i never knew existed until i started doing them for a producer named ken lewis and i mean it's it's insane how in depth you have to go to get these sounds and and to make something modern sound like it was recorded in 1969 um so we'll go into that later but um yeah please yeah um yeah the so King Records and King Studios, it's in Cincinnati. The King Records has a, a really interesting story that um, I believe has been in the news in Cincinnati a lot in the past few years. So it, it was started in the let's see, early 40s by a guy named Sid Nathan, and uh, it ran until the early 70s. Uh, it, it shut down not long after Sid passed away. And King Records, I believe, from, if I understand correctly, was the first integrated record label in the country at, at a time when that was really not cool. Uh, you know, Jim Crow was still very much, uh, very much the law of the land. And um, they, they were putting out all sorts of records, you know, country records, hillbilly records, but also blues records, R and B, uh, jazz, all sorts of stuff. I'm just um, an amazingly wide range of artists. Um, I, I, from what I understand, it was a fully integrated workforce. And I I mean, it's a really cool story. Actually, I have a a family connection. My great grandfather, uh, who's a guy named Clarence Stout was a composer in Vincennes, Indiana, from I think he had his first hit in 1919 and up through the 50s, and he was a white composer in Vincennes. He he composed for both black and white artists of the day, and um, so I have a, a little string of correspondence going back and forth between him and King Records, where he's pitching um, what he calls uh, a couple of hillbilly songs and then a couple of race novelty records, which uh-huh. uh, you know <laughs> there's a there's a genre you don't hear much from anymore. And, uh, no, so, which became R and B later yeah, on. Exactly. Correct? Exactly. Yeah. And, um, so the, and they, so King licensed a couple or a few of his compositions, uh, but then eventually returned them to him because they, they just couldn't interest any of their artists in recording them. Uh, but it, it's kind of cool that, you know, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely ties in. So, so yeah. James Brown, um, James Brown, was on he was on king back in the 60s and i think a lot of his his big hits from that era were all on king records so um and for several years his james brown's um 
kind of production offices were actually in the King Records studio. So his uh, his whole management team and and promotion teams were all there in that same studio. Um, I, I just yesterday had the great pleasure of speaking with a man named Alan Leeds, who was James Brown's tour manager from 1969 until 1972 uh, or mm-hmm. 72 or 73. And and actually, I totally randomly, Alan's book is coming out this uh this week i think maybe tomorrow actually um oh, cool. it, it's just been funny timing i mean Questlove wrote the forward <laughs> to the book uh, alan was he was prince's tour manager from purple rain for that tour on for the next 10 years d'angelo all sorts of stuff he wrote um he's just an incredible archivist he wrote all the uh or i think he was in charge of the liner notes for there's a, a huge james brown compilation called star time and, and alan did the liner notes for that um, and I think basically when he was at King records, um, at some point, uh, James Brown moved to a, a different label. And so they, they got rid of the office. They didn't need to be in Cincinnati anymore. And I guess they were going to just throw this stuff away. And, and Alan asked if he could have it. And James said, yeah, sure. Whatever. Who cares? <laughs> you know, it's trash. Wild. Um, yeah. So, I mean, his archives are just, I think he was describing when he had, I mean, it, it's jaw dropping. <laughs> For example, we were talking yesterday. Alan went down to his archives and he thought he didn't have it, but he looked and thought, oh, yeah, here's the original tracking sheet from the Funky Drummer from 1960. Oh, I mean, so, you know, he had a copy of the original tracking sheet showing it was an eight track, uh, eight track recording. I think the that day they, it was one take, and I'm in a master, and I, I forget exactly. I, I only glanced at it briefly last night. Uh, but, you know, I think the drums were on one track, it's, you know, horns were on another, guitars were on another. And then a, a track or two were open for, for overdubs. So, you know, James Brown's production offices were in this building. And King Records had this really, it wasn't a completely unique arrangement, but a, a really, um, they had a huge advantage over a lot of other labels and that you could do absolutely everything in that building from, they had a recording studio, a mastering studio, an art department, and then a pressing plant. So, you could go in, record the record, um, mix and master it to the heart, press the record. Uh, Alan was describing you could, you know, record on Monday and by Friday, the LPs were on the loading dock ready to ship. So, uh, (laughs) so, you know, so if, if they had a really hot song, they could just, (laughs) you know, get it out out the middleman. Yeah. Get it, get it on the streets that week, which I, I, that was really amazing. So yeah, the, um, my understanding of the studio itself, um, it was just kind of a big open concrete block room that, that had some acoustic treatment. Alan described it as sort of, it wasn't, it wasn't a super cutting edge studio. It wasn't antiquated by any means. Uh, but it was sort of, you know, just a a good functioning studio. I, I don't believe there was anything, you know, it, it wasn't one of the top studios of the country by any by any stretch. Um, so, and and this recording was uh, pretty basic, from what I understand. I think there were two mics on the drums, maybe three, maybe, but everything was just then just mixed down to one channel, um, mm. just one one mono drum track. And um, actually, Alan sent me a, a picture of Clyde Stubblefield in the studio, not on the Funky Drummer session, but on, on an earlier session within that same year. And he was just using his um, his basic uh, road kit, which was a set of Vox drums. Yeah, uh, yeah with the, the kind of the red Croco finish, if that means anything. Yeah, which is Vox are distributed, the American distributor of, Trixon drums. Correct? Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, really unique drums. And yes. uh, yeah, so the, so the kit is there's Clyde Stubblefield in, in the studio with that, that red Vox kit. And then, uh, of, of course, the famous Ludwig Superphonic snare drum, which from what I understand was his, that was his main, main drum back in those days. And um, actually I talked to Stanton Moore about the same, same thing because Stanton had written a great book about about funk drummers and interviewed Clyde and knew him and, and Clyde kind of confirmed that that was the drum he was using in the studio as yeah, that. Not surprised. Yeah. I mean, if there's, <laughs> if, if you're doing 
sample recreations or, you know, trying to get the sounds of the 60s or 70s and you only have one snare drum in your arsenal to work with and you want that sound, uh, the Ludwig Superphonic is a pretty good, yeah. pretty safe bet. So, uh, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so it's cool. That's cool. You know, this session, I actually, at one point, I heard some other backing tracks from I heard, um, individual stems from the rest of the song, not the break beat, but um, just the, the isolated drum track from kind of the rest of the track. And you can hear a bleed from, you can hear the organ bleed and, and a little guitar and bass, I think. Um, and interesting, you know, so the band was all in the same room, all at the same time, just, you know, kind of circled around James, I guess. And um, that one take is it. I, I don't know if they, fixed any mistakes or I, I don't get that impression i think it was just kind of what you hear is what that band laid down and i mean yeah. if, if wow. you go back and listen to it i mean those 16 thoughts that clyde plays they never <laughs> stop in nine minutes and it's wild yeah yeah i, I mean how it, it's incredible <laughs> i i try to play it it's it's like trying to run a funky ultra marathon you know, it's, <laughs> yes. it, it's, it's insane. How did he do that? Yeah. And, and you know, these ghost notes all over the place. And then his left foot doing all these, these kind of stomps. So he, he gets these little 16th note sort of hi-hat slurps all over the place. And I don't know, there's just, there's never been a time where the, anything about the funky drummer part was intuitive to me. I mean, <laughs> No, exactly. Do you know if they if they like would they have played to a metronome back then or would have? This, I highly, have, highly, highly doubt it. Um, I mean, because the timing you don't ever really notice. Like at the end, it's fifty BPM slower. I right, mean, right. It's no, pretty no, it's odd. Just, I yeah. It. I, I mean, I don't know if it's superhuman yeah. or just Clyde Stubblefield. There's only <laughs> one Clyde Stubblefield, and holy yes. cow, was that an amazing recording. Um, yeah, it's kind of the thing too, where you you end up writing a riff or a beat that is so cool, but then you think to yourself, like, I might have to, I'm gonna have to play this every night for the next <laughs> forty yeah. years. It's like, <laughs> oh boy, I, I wrote a real, uh, you know, wrote himself into a corner there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Do you know what kind of symbols he was using there? I mean, probably just a Zildjian's. Okay, know, probably, and they're probably pretty thin. I mean, so I, I'm yeah. told that Clyde played really quietly which I think is, is, I mean, you know, if you try to play that beat loud and put your arm into it, you will never make it anywhere. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, and which, which kind of, it fits the sounds he's getting out of those drums. I mean, he's, he's clearly not slamming it. And I think so much, so much of just the kind of the bigness of that, that break beat comes from then the compression and the reverb. So, yep. and as best we can tell, and again, we we're really just we're guessing because the the engineer on the track was a guy named Dave Harrison, who later went on to found Harrison Consoles, which is um, I, and they're very much still active. I, I believe Dave passed away in '95, um, but I mean his company is very much still still around making gargantuan car, car, recording consoles all over the world. Yeah and uh, based in Nashville. And um, so the, man, we are, we are guessing just based on what we know, we, we think there's probably, he probably compressed that break beat. And we think that they sent the drums, at least one of the mics, they sent up to an echo chamber, which they had built yeah. in the, uh, I guess it was in the upstairs office. They, they carved out a little bit of, of space and, um, and built this echo chamber, which is just a, basically a long hallway. And I found a, an interview with an engineer who was a king in the 50s and 60s. And he was describing when they were building that this echo chamber. And they said they, they drove the, the plaster guys nuts because they insisted that the, the plaster just had to be polished so it was mirror smooth for this, this room. And he was describing yeah. they had a microphone in the room, of course, you know, capturing. So they would have a speaker. They would send whatever they wanted an echo in. They would send it through that speaker. The room would, the sound would echo, and then they had a microphone would, which would pick up the sound and, and get this, this reverb sound. And he was describing a situation back in the 60s where they had that microphone on a motor so they can move it 
kind of move it around in the room oh, itself cool. and, you know, dial in the exact reverb they wanted, which I thought was interesting. Man. I mean, that's, I, I just sort of assumed that was a modern thing. I, you know, people ha- now have these little robot devices where you can put your, <laughs> you know, you can use a joystick and put your, uh, your mic where you want it on the guitar amp without having Jeez, to touch it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah now they're doing that 50 years ago. 50 no, years it's, ago. you know, it's just so neat too about how they're using like minimal, how it's like you said, maybe two or three mics. Yeah. Then which are bust down to one channel, yep. which cause like, cause you're using at that point, like four track, eight track, um, tape. Yeah. Consoles. Eight, tape, eight you're recording that tape. Point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. So, and you know, the whole mm-hmm. band all playing together in one room. And I'm sure too, the sound of those drums is also, because they were all in the same room, it's also the sound of the drums going through all the other mics that are open yeah. and live for the rest of the band. So, you know, there's that that sound is not just the three mics. It's also the sound of, you know, it's probably going through James Brown's vocal mic and yeah. the horn mics and, you know, wh- whatever else would have been would have been open in that room. Hmm. Um, That's a great point. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, and it's such a unique sound. If you, if you go back and really just, start di- dissecting what this thing is i i've never heard another snare drum sound exactly that way i mean i've heard there are other other tracks that um you know the cloud was on that it's you can tell it's probably that same drum but it just nothing has that same uh i mean i mean alan we've described it as this whole session was just the perfect storm of all of these things came together to make these two measures of drums on a nine minute song <laughs> it sort of changed the world. Wow. And, and yeah. nobody, nobody suspected that it would. Nobody, when they did it, it was just a throw in, yeah, whatever it's a, it's a, it's a vamp, it's a B side, whatever, who cares? Yeah. Cause that's, that's the kicker of all this is like, it was just a, a fun kind of like, let's just roll kind of thing. Yeah. And then what they got though is, is, is amazing. So then jumping forward, after people discovered it and did all of that, you know, it turned into the hip hop thing. My question is, um, and stop me if I'm jumping too far forward here, but about the legality. I think that's one of the most interesting things about this whole thing is how people legally um, get away with using this beat. Yeah, well, so Clyde Stubblefield, when he did the session, it was just work for hire. He, he got paid for the session and that was it. That was as far as it went. James Brown took a uh, complete, you know, complete songwriting and publishing rights. So he owned the song yep. and, um, yep. yeah. So I, as best I understand it, Clyde never really saw a penny beyond the day he recorded that, that track. And, uh, which, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I, I, my understanding of this is pretty sketchy. So don't take my legal opinion on this at all. Sure. Um, but you know, so basically, any time you use the original sample, um, you, you you have to pay the James Brown or, or his his estate, um, and um, you know, so James did very well from the Funky Drummer break. I think starting in the in the eighties and probably still to this day. As I understand it, the legality with with drums specifically, you can't really. What's the word? You can't copyright a drum beat. You can't. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I've yeah. heard that. Yeah. So, you know, the beat itself, it's it's Clyde. It's it's. I mean, it, that is his genius. And you know, anybody can play that beat and put it on a record. If you play the funky drummer melody line and harmony, then you know you're in trouble. If you're just playing the drum beat, yeah, whatever. You know, it, they're it. it pisses me off but it's, you know mm-hmm. it's it's left over from i believe from you know kind of the piano roll days of the early early 20th century when you know it's just the melody and the harmony and that's all that matters drums don't count drums aren't music yeah on a previous episode i did about working drummers um with matt brennan there was a big discussion of how drummers just it's exactly what you're saying where they get paid less it doesn't yeah. count it's unskilled labor it yeah. doesn't matter yep. um yeah and he actually starts out uh, the book with a quote from uh, Clyde Stubblefield that says, all of my life in drumming, I'm kind of paraphrasing, I've always wondered about my money. Yeah. And the kicker, I think, for this is that it is such an iconic drum beat, but it's still a drum beat that can't mm-hmm. be copyrighted because uh, it's kind of like um, Ginger Baker, Sunshine of Your Love, where mm-hmm. it's a very, 
it's the beat to the song, but because of what it is, I guess it's not, you can't copyright it. So how did he react to this drum beat being used everywhere? His beat, was he happy about it? Was he sad about it? Was he upset? How did that go? Um, let's see. You know, so I talked to Jim Payne as well, who's, uh, his website is funkydrummer.com. And uh, Jim, Jim knew Clyde, and, and, and they became friends later in, in Clyde's life. And, uh, Jim was telling me that kind of, I think he was, there was a, a point where he was not very happy about it, but eventually sort of came to terms with it and was kind of at peace with, all right, whatever. It was a, you know, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my information secondhand and, you know, I wasn't there and I've, I've never met Clyde. I, it's one of my big regrets in life was not being able to get up to Madison, Wisconsin and go see Cl- Clyde play live. Um, yeah, yeah. I grew up in Indiana. Madison wasn't that far and, uh, I just never made it. So, um, I, you know, my, my thought was my, my impression is that for him, it was something he's proud of. He was proud of, and obviously as he should be. And, you know, it, it gave him some opportunities and definitely, you know, gave him a, gave him a name and a, and a start in the business or a, not a start in the business, yeah. but you, you know what I mean? Um, absolutely. James Brown infamously has had multiple drummers playing at one time. Uh, I think most famously is Jabo and Clyde, but on the funky drummer beat itself, that was just Clyde. That was right? just Clyde. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Alan Leeds was telling me that I, I think Jabo was was there at the studio that day when when they tracked it, but you know was just sort of hanging out, not playing on that song. Um, and the the impression I got from the from the show was, uh, I, I believe I read Clyde saying at one point that when he first joined the band, there were five drummers on stage at one time, but but each drummer was only playing at one time for the most part. You know, oh wow, James liked you know he liked the feel feel of that guy for this song. He liked the feel of that guy for this song, <laughs> and you know, and then everyone oh, they're on notice saying, "Hey, if you mess up, you know, I'm switching mid song. You know, <laughs> next beat you." And uh, <laughs> so you know, and if you're spacing out and you miss it, you know, you're fined or <laughs> you're out. And uh, yeah. I, I mean, an, an intense. <laughs> and intense, intense yeah in those situations that he'll start a song high energy super fast and to start funky drummer really fast <laughs> sounds like a nightmare <laughs> yeah I, um alan was describing it it was kind of an instrumental um where it was sort of it sounded kind of like the show back then was sort of a variety show where the, the first Half was the band playing instrumentals. Um, there'd be some of the, the background singers would do, they would, they would sing songs. There'd be comedian. Um, James would do uh, show tunes or something. And then after, after intermission would be start time. And that's when all the big hits would come out. Um, so it kind of like, you know, funky drone was just sort of a jam. They were just doing during the intermission. And so I don't get the impression that it was, that track was part of start time when here we go, you know, hang on to your hats. Yeah. 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 I gotcha. Okay. Now what you have been doing, um, can you explain a little bit about what you were talking about? And, uh, you mentioned earlier, but sample, what is it that you're doing? So it's sample, sample replays and, or sample replays. Re- what is that? Okay. <laughs> this is a situation where, um, an artist will write a song based on a sample, a breakbeat, um, some, you know, old drums. And for whatever reason, they can't clear the original sample for the record. Um, there might be, you know, their publishing reasons. Maybe they can't find the publisher or for some reason, the publisher doesn't want to give the rights, whatever it is. And I've, I've seen several of these, these scenarios. Um, so what the artist will do is hire a team to recreate the sample so that it sounds absolutely identical to the original, where there's mm. just, it's indistinguishable, where, um, you know, you've, you've, but it's a brand new work. And because it's drums and you can't copyright drums and, um, you know, you can, you can slot it in. And so it, it's not, you're not using the actual master recording. You're using a cover of it. So it's a completely different, um, you know, you pay a completely different rate 
for that than you would, um, you know, if you're okay. using the actual master recording. Uh, uh, licensing and all that. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, and again, I, I am not a lawyer. I take all this with a grain of salt. This is my understanding from, you know, I, I'm, once again, I'm the drummer on these sessions, so I'm, I'm kind of the, <laughs> the little man on the totem pole in, in all of this. <laughs> um, so I, I've been doing these since the early 2000s. Um, I, I worked for a producer named Ken Lewis, who is probably the best at the business in this. I, I think he's kind of done, he's done a lot of them and uh, doesn't do them that much anymore. He's, he's moved on to, to bigger and better things. But it's an insanely difficult process. And I had no clue before I started doing these. Uh, the, the first one I worked on was... Um, it was actually uh, Jay Z's Black Album, and I, I got a call, and we were going to recreate a sample. And I started putting drums together, and then found out an hour or two later that we were double booked, so they already had somebody else to do it. So um, mm. that was my uh, that was my first uh, heartbreak in the industry of Oh my God, this could be my <laughs> this is my career. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be a Jay Z yeah. record, and ah, oh, wow. Crap. So, um, so my my first actual credit was was for. Um, uh, a Kanye West record, which I got the call in the, in the, that's still pretty good. Uh, you know, I was, I was <laughs> literally in the delivery room. My wife had just had a baby. I was picked up the phone to call my parents to say, it's a boy. And I got a text saying, you know, I need you for a Kanye West record immediately. <laughs> so, oh, oh, geez. Yeah, that's, that's funny time. Yeah, see you, honey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't leave that day, but it was the next day. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. So the process is, you have to sonically recreate something and you have absolutely no idea what the drums were, how they were tuned, how they were muffled, where they were placed, what the room sounded like, what the mics were, what the heads were, uh, what kind of sticks the drummer was using, what the cymbals were, how high the cymbals were from the drums, uh, you know, what the ambience of the room was, what other mics were open, what, tape gear they used what console what eq what compression how it was mixed how uh you know what kind of tape it was recorded to what kind of tape it was mastered to what the mastering was like what the you know and then it was yeah and then it was sampled from a record and you know you have no idea what condition that record was in and they're scratching from the record and then you know they're the sound of whatever the <laughs> you know the amplifier that was amplifying the record so you have absolutely no idea or basically no idea of any of the these details so all you can do is just listen to it and figure out how to get that exact sound um so you have to get the sounds exactly right and then you have to get the performance exactly right and uh the samples that, that are being chosen are chosen for their really unique human feel and and you know this funky groovy half the time really weird sounding recordings so you have to kind of surgically, scientifically dissect every element of what the sound is and then play it yourself. So, you know, you're, you're trying to tune these drums or, or match cymbals from a studio that hasn't existed in 50 years and, yeah. and then trying to play exactly like, you know, some famously funky drummer or, or some totally unknown drummer who just had a really cool thing going on. And this is on a kit. This is not programming. This is actually recreating it on a kit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, but a really interesting thing that will happen in this process is that, um, which, which took me a while to, to understand is that um, rarely are you really just playing the full, you know, setting up the full kit, putting up some mics, playing the whole part as it was, and then, you know, and then mixing your sample replay from that. A lot of yeah. times, uh, for example, there will be, you know, the, the kick drum, if the, the kick drum part's simple, they'll just, they'll find a sample, whatever. It's, it's a kick drum. It's two notes. I, you know, I can yeah, find a sample, sure. um, which saves, you know, it's two hours of sorting through every sound li library known to man, but it saves eight hours of trying to get the kick drum exactly right. Um, so, and then, you know, you've got, let's just say it's a hi-hat part with some opening and closing parts and then uh, a snare drum that has kind of some some main beats and then ghost notes and there will be times that i'll use a completely different pair of hi-hats for each element so the closed sound is one pair 
the open sound is the oh. second pair. The, um, you know, like the, the foot pedal sound is a third pair. There'll be one snare drum for the, for the two and four, and then a totally different snare drum for the ghost notes, because it just speaks differently. And, and, you know, I, you never find the one snare drum that speaks exactly like the snare yeah, drum. That was know. it. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, Jeez. and it's also the, you're not just, you're not finding a snare drum that, that speaks exactly like the raw drum sound in the room from the original recording. It's got to speak how the record was mixed and how it was then recorded from the, from vinyl or however they, they got the sample. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm sure if you were actually in the room at some of these sessions, what you heard acoustically is just going to be a completely different thing than what's on the, the final record. So, for example, when we were trying to do our funky drummer break, we, naturally the first drum we go to is a Ludwig Superphonic. And I have a, you know, 60 Ludwig Superphonic. It's, it's great. It does, you know, it's got the sound of the Ludwig Superphonic. But that it wasn't no matter what we did, we tuned it to exactly the pitch and, you know, did everything we could to, to get it exactly right. And the ghost notes just spoke in a different way on, on my drum than they do on the, the original. So we ended up with, I mean, actually, once again, our, our, our final funky drummer breakbeat uh, recreation is it's a combination of a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, uh, you know, a couple different drums, uh, sound effects, echo you know recording the sound of my studio bathroom uh, <laughs> I have the, that's awesome <laughs> did you use a vox kit on it because you know what drums he used I, at that time until yesterday i had no idea what drums he used uh i actually oh alan, i see i see yeah so alan was telling me that i, I always wondered if there was a house kit at king or yeah sure you know, what, what they would have used and alan said that they, he looked at the schedule he said the night before i think they were in Asheville, north carolina and then they had a day off when they went to the studio and then the next show I think was in Akron, Ohio, um, just up the road from, from Cincinnati. And mm -hmm. so we were saying with, with the schedule like that, they probably just would have pulled in, uh, and pulled out their, their road kit. And at that point, um, they're in 68. Alan has pictures of, of, uh, of Clyde and, and, and Jabba with, um, both with matching red box kits. And by 69, I think Clyde still had his box kit. Jabba had a, a Ludwig kit as well. Mm. So we're kind of just guessing he probably would have pulled in. Clyde would have pulled his box kit with his Ludwig snare. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it certainly makes sense. I mean, the, the kick drum, if you listen to the sample, it, it's got kind of a mid-rangey kind of quiet knock. I mean, it's not a... Okay. It, it, that's kind of a smaller drum. I think, I believe Clyde was playing a 13, 16, 22 kit. Uh, so, okay. you know, definitely not, they weren't, weren't jazz sized drums by any stretch. Um, but no. you know, he wasn't hitting that hard. I, I think, or, or really lightly from what I understand. So, you know, and he sure wasn't laying into the kick drum and it, you know, it's just a very different sound than you hear from any kind of modern, <laughs> anything modern. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Um, gotcha. So back on track here. So then you, for any artist, let's say like, uh, cause you've worked with like Alicia Keys, Kanye, John Legend, Drake, Eminem, which obviously by that list, they're typically, um, hip hop mm -hmm. artists. Mm -hmm. They would say, I like this drum beat from artist X. I want you to recreate it so I can, so I can get a, get away with it basically. And then you do that process of let's let's call it scientifically recreating mm -hmm. that exact same sound. And because the funky legal stuff, they can get away with create creating that again. And there's no, Hey, that's the drum beat from this song and we're going to sue you. Right. As far as I understand it, <laughs> you uh, just do what you're told. I just do. Uh, yeah. I, I, again, I say the hell out of that legal stuff. I, I, have, I yeah. have no way qualified to, uh, to, to speak to that world. But, uh, yeah, so that's, you know, I play the drums, the, I mean, I, I want to make sure I'm not um, glossing over a huge part of that process, which is the mix engineer's job. I mean, it's just okay. taking yeah, the raw absolutely. tracks and, and manipulating them so that they sound identical to the original is, I mean, it's, it's uh, a 
gargantuan job. So as an example, um, I worked on the, on Kanye's record, Yeezus on the, the first track. And there's a, it's a Daft Punk producer. There's a whole you know, this crazy electronica. And then there's a little break where a gospel choir comes in. It's a little four measure break. Uh, so I played the drums and, um, the entire break was recreated by Ken Lewis, where I think I got the call on a Monday we track drums till about five in the morning. My my assistant Matt Teitelman played tambourine. Uh, I don't think Ken slept for three days straight. So he got my drums on mon- Monday at five, and then Tuesday had to put together an entire gospel choir to then recreate this this really obscure recording, and then mix it. And then I think the record was in stores on Saturday. Oh man. I mean, it was an insane turnaround. I mean, and, and that's usually how it worked for me. It, it, it was, um, there have been fewer of them in the past couple of years. I think, I, you know, I, I don't know if as many of these records are being made using this, you know, <laughs> this process of recreating an old sample. Um, but I mean, the timetables were always just, <laughs> Hey, we need this yesterday. Wow. Do it now. It's, you know, and be suddenly panicked trying to, recreate yeah. the funky drummer i mean i do for m and m i had to redo it in a night um and thank god i've been practicing it and that was funky drummer so you so but not all of these are funky drummer yeah right? not not at all so alicia keys was a um was a billy squire track called the big big beat with bobby chenard on drums uh which is you know big rock and roll drums the uh Jesus was a little you know kind of gospel choir the drake record was a another gospel thing and did some rick ross stuff which is a big, you know a whole bunch of concert toms concert tom fills uh ti record just recently same thing um you know lots of multiple concert toms so i i'm one of the, the few drummers i i know who have multiple flavors of big concert tom setups so uh hmm. Just because, nice. yeah, you know, kind of like Hal Blaine. Yeah, yeah, but you know, the Hal Blaine sound was um, uh, Blaymeyer, the uh, fiberglass shells. That's yes. a cool sound. I don't have any of those. There, there's uh, the Jenkins Barton <laughs> company is, is making those again yeah. one day on my yeah. it's on my list. Um, but uh, That's yeah, it's awesome. It's a funny business. It's it's um, when I first heard it described, it didn't sound that hard. I mean, how especially when some of these ones where, you know, it's a really uh, easy and sort of exposed drum beat when you can play here, plain as day, exactly what they're doing. It's a beat you played before. And, you know, like, oh, I totally get every part of what they're playing. How hard can this be? And once you dive in, you realize that the closer you get, the further you realize you are You're like, Oh man, for sure. yeah. the, the snare drum, it's the wrong pitch. It's ringing too much. Now it's not ringing enough. Now the snares are buzzing too much. They're, now they're not buzzing enough. Now, you know, and I changed those, but now the pitch is wrong. But now, you know, and then, and then there's a ring out of the kick drum, but uh, on the original, but I'm not getting it from my kick drum. So, you know, okay, well, you put a floor tom next to the kick drum and tune the floor tom to well, ring yeah. the same pitch as the kick drum. And, um, you know, and then the, the mix engineer is trying to, okay, you know, there's some weirdness on the, you know, some phasing issue on the original, but how are we going to recre- recreate that? Uh, you know, and oh, it's a million little things. Yeah. And it, like you said, where the snare is rattling, the bass drum is rattling the snare and the floor tom is vibrating at this pitch and yep. the height yep. of the cymbals yep, and yep, yep, the yep. head choice on, but I mean, there's, it's it's kind of like how you if you're tracking drums you don't break them down if you if you break down the mics and move the kit you're pretty much never going to get exactly the same sound that you had yeah yeah absolutely I mean unless you do what you're doing <laughs> which no one should I mean it's unless, yeah wow I mean these are these are big budget productions so there is a budget yeah, to pay course. a crew to do this to stay up for a little literally three days straight and and do this. Um, that's so cool. So it's fun, you know, but I, I absolutely love it. I mean, I, I, I think it's so much fun to do. I, they're exhausting in the moment and they can be really stressful as if, you know, everybody's under a serious timeline. So it's like, where are, the, are these tracks going? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, the, the four times ringing and again, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't uh, care. No, like, yeah. the tr- and, you know, and the, 
biggest thing, not the biggest thing, one of the big things I learned really early on was I was thinking, oh, I have to, you know, get the exact right drum that he used and, and two, with the same kind of heads and two, and, blah, 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 and they couldn't care less. It, you know, if, if you have a drum from Kmart and it sounds uh, like the funky drummer snare, then that's the drum to use. Who cares? Yeah. What a, you know, the microphones couldn't care less what you stick in front of it all it cares you know and i don't think mix engineers care is what does it sound like and does it sound close enough to what we're recreating that i can take it and then manipulate it so um, um well, and i think that that's true about uh there's something about recording drums where you might hear a snare in the room and you go that sounds like crap yeah it sounds so loose and just papery and then you go into the booth and you listen and you go oh Okay, I get it. That sounds great right now, where in the room you're like, oh my God, dude, your snare sounds like garbage. So but I had a funny, I, I played on a John Legend track called In America, and, and we recorded it at the city, um, in, in the city at a studio called Germano, and uh, Steve Jordan keeps some kits there. So we got to, you know, record on Steve Jordan's kit for this track, which it was one of my favorite days of recording drums ever. Um, Steve wasn't there, but you know they so he was sure. staff. And, his, his spirit was. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And, and you know, I've been a fan of Steve since I was a little kid and saw him on Saturday Night Live when it, with the house band. Um, yeah. Which definitely dates me. But um, so you know, the the kit was a, a you know nice new set of of uh, Gretsch broadcasters and the snare drum. I pulled out the snare and yeah, I'm like oh. <laughs> so out of tune or whatever just kind of we, we were doing shootouts we went through i don't know 15 snares uh with a bunch of different options we had about 60 snare sounds to to uh to shoot for and the the producer dave tozer had a really clear direction of exactly what he wanted the drums to sound like with kind of a tame impala sound and um so we, we went through you know i brought a bunch of my stuff and we used a couple of the house drums and we had this, you know, this Gretsch broadcast where we hit it. Oh, God, this is a lot of tunes. This is a lot of crap. What, you know, this, this drum will never make it. And, I mean, we went in the room. It was incredible how it sounded on tape. We just, <laughs> just, I mean, I was sitting there with my drum up. And I, That's that same drum? And they, they didn't, you, you know, that was just flat through the, through the board, through an SSL console. Just, you know, oh, you know, a 57 and the snare drum, totally out of tune, sounded like crap in the room, all garbled and messy. And, oh, my God. That was, I mean, we ended up using my drum because either of these two would be great and say, well, you know, you brought yours. It's, it's unique. It's, you know, we'll do, we'll do that one just to whatever. Um, man. So at least you got to experience Steve's drums and, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah that was cool. <laughs> hear the magic. And that was the secret magic. Yeah, that was really cool. As we close out here, why don't you tell us about getting the and sure. tell us about the website and all that good stuff. So the website is gettingthesound.com and we teach how to do this process of making sample replays. And, and then we touch on, you know, basically everything that goes into that. There are so many facets of this between the recording, the drums and mixing and, and uh, sound design as well. So uh, I, I'm doing it with, with my production partner, Cooper Anderson, who is a, a just a brilliant mix engineer and producer. He's worked on many of these same sample replays for about as long. We, we first met at a, uh, a session with Ken Lewis at, at Electric Lady back in the early 2000s. We've done a bunch of these together. So Cooper really, really understands this process as well from the mix end. And uh, so we're teaching these long form tutorials. They're really in depth on here's how to go about doing it. And a really important point is that we are teaching the process that we're using it's not really so much about the gear simply because whatever gear i have at my studio whatever gear cooper has and whatever plugins he has is going to be completely different from what anybody else has and everything we have is totally different from what they were using originally so it's not really so much about well you have to have a like superphonic and you have to have a a U47 over the drums mm -hmm. and whatever. Cause you no, know, you don't. And, um, even if we all had Clyde's actual gear in the actual studio, there's just no telling it's going to sound the same anyhow with us playing it. No, so sure. The important thing is just learning this process of how do you actually go about making whatever you have sound like something completely different recorded at a completely different time in a completely different place. So, you know, 
shootouts of, of gear, shootouts of components of gear, mic shootouts, uh, just the, the whole mix process and, and all the, the layers. I mean, watching Cooper mix this, I mean, it's just all these, you know, we, we track the drums, the raw drums as close as we possibly could. And then Cooper takes that to a whole other level with just these, you know, minute adjustments, this, that, you know, little steps constantly a being back and forth between the original so for our tutorials, we actually recreated the we recreated the original, and then we recreated our recreation, if that makes sense. Uh, because again, we, we don't know the you know we don't have the, the rights to the master buggy drummer break, uh, only the, yeah. the James Brown, did, you, know, you know. So, uh, but again, the, the process is the same. It, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, it's just kind of learning how to do this stuff, and it's I mean it's intense. It's really intense. And it's- we. Sounds like a ton of little things that add up to the, the big oh, picture. My God. It's kind of yeah. mixing in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and part of it is is kind of sound design in in some ways. I mean, we had to. I ended up at Home Depot just tapping on empty paint cans to try to match this, you know, match this weird pitch that's coming out of the mm. snare drum or or coming out of the snare drum as it's been translated through compression and reverb and everything else. Uh, you know, it's got this weird kind of sound to it and, um, Mm. you know, and then blending that in, figure how to, you know, we're using sine waves to add (laughs) stuff, all sorts of distortion. Uh, so yeah. And and we teach every bit of it And, and kind of the, I would see all these videos online saying, Hey, you know, we, we got the sound of this record or that sound or whatever. And uh, there was one in particular where, where they were recreating some Motown stuff. And it was cool. It sounded great. They had a whole band you know, at the studio, and they recreated some Motown tracks. It sounded really cool. It sounded a lot like the original. Um, but, I mean, it was a multi-million dollar studio using just, you know, a Neve console, a massive Neve console, I think, and, you know, microphones that cost 10 grand each. And, yeah. um, you know, a huge band, a huge budget. And the video was 20 minutes long and said, you know, they're talking, describing about how we spent hours doing, you know, doing all this tuning and prepping and everything. And then to show you the, the final result, which is cool. But, you know, what were those hours? What were you doing in those hours? I mean, that's what I want to yeah. know. Like, that's, that's where the information is. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's entertaining really. to see, oh, cool. Wow. Yeah. Look at all that amazing gear and that multi-million dollar studio and how that's fun to watch. But if you're actually trying to do that yourself, if, you know, you're a recording engineer or an artist and you're, you have a home studio, you know, and you want to sound like it's 1965 on your track. I mean, how do you actually go about doing it? And, um, Hmm. so that's, that's really what we're trying to teach how, how you would go about doing that. I mean, those, and these vintage sounds are such a part of modern music. Um, not so much the kind of modern programmed EDM stuff and all that, but I, you know, Dude, these old sounds are very much still with us. They're famous and great for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, for example, after today, I have a session for an artist in, in Europe and we're doing kind of old school breakbeats. I'm going to be doing, you know, playing drums and some congas and he kind of wants the sound of 1973. So, you know, I've got my, awesome. I've got my fake uh, shag carpeting drum booth up with uh, gobos <laughs> cool. and, and heavy blankets and, uh, you know, lots of muffling and, uh, and uh, a bunch of rhythm mics. <laughs> That's awesome. You're the new funky drummer. You're the guy. <laughs> well, I, 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 I wouldn't go that far, but uh, <laughs> Jim Payne That's is the funny. funky drummer. He's, he's funkydrummer.com. Uh, yeah. You know, I just, well, you're keeping it alive. I'm, you're I'm absolutely keeping it alive. I'm doing everything I can to keep it alive. It's, I, you know, what... What Clyde Stipplefield did with James Brown at King Studios in 1969, you know, 50 years ago, I, I think the actually, what did I write? I think we're just about to the actual 50 year anniversary of when that single released. Uh, wow. I think in the next month or so, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, there should I be mean, a, boy that 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 changed the world. That's, yeah, that's, there's no denying. That. Yeah, we should. There should it should be a national holiday. I, I don't understand why it, it is. should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Funky Drummer National That's, Funky Drummer Day, and especially here in Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you guys can find Dylan online at gettingthesound.com. Um, and that's getting the sound on Instagram and, um, you can find him on Instagram at Dylan Wissing Drums, correct? W I S S I N G. Yep. And, um, 
This has been amazing. I think we've covered a uh, just an incredibly interesting and unique aspect that um, I personally did not know all these details. I knew very little about it. So um, I just want to thank you for for teaching us all about your knowledge and that really cool element of uh, recreating samples um, that I had no clue about. So I thanks so much for taking the time to to talk with us about oh man it was absolutely my pleasure and i love what you're doing with the podcast i'm a huge his- history buff history awesome on, you know on, on a big level and on a highly specific drum level so um that's great. yeah I, I love what you're doing with it with the podcast so please keep going thank you so much and, and i should say thank you to ben o'brien smith from sounds like a drum who is the one who actually connected us um, yeah. originally so yeah shout out to ben uh, for man, uh for doing I, that i love what sounds i mean sounds like a drum are doing what i always wanted to do they're just doing a, a much more um regular basis and uh i you know kudos to them i love what those guys are doing too it's it's really cool stuff and, yeah, very you know, clean and professional and tight and yeah, yeah. love it. Yeah, and they're and they're covering all the stuff. You know, they're taking the tapping the shells. That one, <laughs> I was like, oh, that'd be really I cool know. to do. You know, when yeah. am I going to do that? And they did it. So they did it. There's no shortage of ideas. That <laughs> they're 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 clever guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's cool stuff. Cool, cool stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dylan. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. It was my pleasure. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.